Welcome back, everybody, to the ROI Online Podcast. And today, I'm proud to introduce you to Vinay Koshi. Vinay interviewed me on his podcast a while back, and it only makes sense that we would have him on the ROI Podcast. Vinay, welcome to the ROI Online Podcast. Yeah, pleasure to be here. Hey, so Vinay is coming to us all the way from... Um, I'm messing this up here. Here we go. Brisbane. <laughs> yeah. So Vinay is coming all the way from Brisbane, <laughs> Queensland, Australia today. So we had to set up our time to meet. I mean, this is at dinner time. I'm talking, but I'm totally happy. Last time I had to tell him about my breakfast while he waited to go eat his <laughs> dinner. And, um, so, um, Vinay, tell us a little bit. Tell us a bit about, first of all, I want to say your podcast is called the Predictable B2B Success Podcast Correct. as well. So tell us a little bit about Sproutworth and uh, when you started it and give us a little backstory of, of how you ended up where you are now. Sure. Um, so I guess I got my start in, uh, in nonprofits initially uh, before I transitioned into a um, a for-profit company, which was essentially a, a SaaS company, even though it wasn't called SaaS at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it kind of thrived there uh, in, in that I was able to uh, help a lot of clients develop uh, rather nascent online marketing strategies uh, and, and really enjoyed that. Uh, however, I very quickly reached a point where I wasn't able to grow very much and uh, found myself in telecommunications and things of that nature which wasn't a very pleasant experience um, in that they had a very different sales psychology uh, and uh, left that after a bit and found myself working in a digital agency from which I got laid off. Now, having seen uh, the positives of, of uh, doing sales through building relationships and being on the other end where it's all revenue focused and numbers focused, uh, I figured there had to be a better way to do things. And if my thinking was correct, then I should put my money where my mouth is, not look for another job and do my own thing. Hence why I started Sprout With uh, after a few failures, um, decided that content uh, was an area that I could uh, work in and, and develop. Um, uh, started guest posting, got a few clients, made a bit of traction that way, but also found that over time, content was becoming something of a commodity. Hence, why I started the podcast, I ran a virtual summit uh, and a few things in that space. So to me, it's, it's interesting. We started our agency, I'm relating with you. And if you work with a client, but the hardest thing for the client to produce is content. Absolutely. And I realized that we need to really help facilitate their thinking it through what would be the best content, helping pull it out of them in some way, be it an interview or, or whatever that may be, and then helping write that content. And so I'm really relating. That was the most important piece that we were bringing as far as a service to our clients. Were you recognizing the same thing? Uh, absolutely. I think um, uh, that's kind of clarified over time in that uh, I seem to resonate pretty well with people who are very uh, mission focused or mission driven in, in that they want to solve a problem in, in the world uh, and also very much relationship uh, um, oriented. Um, and uh, companies, especially in the B2B space that um, deal with complex sales, uh, the, this content and, and podcasting, for example, it is a great way to build your audience and, and presence. So podcasting, I'm going to stop for just a second. Now I'll cut this sure. out. So at the end of this, we're going to do the re-intro because I had the wrong speaker on, but I wanted to confirm before we go through this whole yep. conversation. Am I <laughs> no coming worries. loud and clear now? You are. Yeah. Yep. All right. Perfect. All right. So, Vinay, I'm really interested in that, you know, podcasting has been around for a while. But when you go and look at the stats as far as internationally where podcasts are popular, obviously the states are the leading areas, maybe mm -hmm. some in Europe. But 
I'm interested in, you're pretty much on the cutting edge, at least on the early trend line in Southeast Asia area where you, you are, wrong? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I would say that is probably correct. Uh, I would say maybe Australia is a little bit ahead of the curve, Australia and New Zealand, uh, in that we do have um, an audience that does listen to podcasts um, uh, or at the very least uh, has Spotify on their phone. The, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of Australians would uh, have Spotify on their phone. And if they're not listening to podcasts, they're certainly listening to music. Uh, and it's just a short step away to listening to a podcast that they, uh, uh, you know, wish to learn something from or, or tune into. So the, tell us about the kind of clients that you're working with. Obviously they need to be a little progressive if, if in the strategy of producing content, you're mm -hmm. getting them to adopt podcasting. Uh, yes, it, it can be um, a, a little bit of a stretch. Uh, there are a lot of companies that have bought into this whole idea of producing content and, and uh, trying to be educational in some form or shape. Uh, the challenge, though, uh, I think for most companies is that there still is very much this idea that content should relate to revenue. Uh, and uh, I was just reading uh, a post, uh, I think, just a couple of days ago by Mark Schaefer, who, who mm -hmm. said, uh, and, and I, I would agree with him, that that is a, a, a wrong way of thinking about content, uh, simply because um, if you look at most interactions, it takes months, sometimes years before there is enough interest um, and a lot of other factors that fall into place for someone to reach out and say, uh, hey, can we have a chat? Or uh, I'm interested in what you're offering and, and uh, you know, can we explore this? Uh, so thinking about content in, in short-term metrics uh, is a disservice. And really the companies that do it well are those who invest wholeheartedly in helping people or teaching people uh, and, and giving that, um, uh, which I say without any reservation mm -hmm. uh, and building that up, up over time. It's a bit of a mind sh mindset shift for Correct. a business owner to perceive their self identity as someone that produces unique valuable insights from their mm -hmm. perspective about why they do what they do in their industry and how they help people and get past this like, well, am I giving away my trade secrets or, you know, there's all these good sound good, like reasons why yeah. you wouldn't want to do that. And how do you, how do you have that conversation where, where you go, okay, this is how we would look at it as a legitimate business mm -hmm. asset without expecting like immediate results? Uh, uh, you do need to treat it as, a, as an asset. Now, um, I think the other issue that uh, people encounter is this idea of, uh, I'm not a good writer. Um, I don't have enough people to pull all this content production together. Um, and certainly, uh, if it's not gonna drive the bottom line, why should I invest all this time and energy to, in, into something like that? And I think, Podcasting in particular is, is a good way to bridge that gap to an extent. Because if you have the mindset that business is about people and serving people, then podcasting is a great way to build relationships and, and serve them. So, for example, uh, um, Steve, uh, I know you help people with their brand story and, and their websites and things of that nature. And there are a bunch of, of uh, companies that do websites uh, out there and you're, you're competing with them. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, certainly you build your, your authority and, and brand over time. But some of the simple things that we can do is, um, like on, the, on, a, on a podcast, uh, talk about their challenges and, and problems and how they've found success to date. Uh, but also, uh, this, this could be a podcast or it could be something like a webinar where maybe you offer uh, uh, a, one quick fix that uh, people could implement straight away and, and you get maybe five people uh, onto a call have a look at their websites beforehand maybe someone on your team reviews them gives them a quick uh, spiel of what they think the website is about mm -hmm. and then um, uh, if i'm not mistaken you've with the um, 
story brand uh, theory, mm -hmm. uh, there are three questions you need to answer uh, in, in about eight seconds. Uh, right. one, one of which is, I think, uh, what is this website about? Uh, 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 what is it and how do I get it? Would I be correct in, in saying that? Absolutely. It's the grunt yeah. test. Yes. The right. grunt test. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, just going through that and offering a, a solution to at least one of those three questions to a client is some, something that they can take away and implement straight away. Mm -hmm. Also, there is the ability to start forming a, a network of friends uh, with five people on a call where you can provide, you know, specific implementable advice to each person. You can talk to each other. Uh, for about a half hour or so, uh, uh, apart from the teaching. And that's a value. Most people don't do that. Uh, I, I remember when I was working with the SaaS company, I used to do that, but it, uh, it wasn't online because we didn't have Zoom calls and things at the time. Mm -hmm. But I would pull in five local businesses, um, provide some key advice, and then begin networking uh, with, uh, uh, with them by saying to someone who uh, was building homes, that you should talk to this other person who runs a winery because you kind of have the same kind of customers. Mm -hmm. So if you combine your databases, you're probably going to reach uh, uh, the right kind of audience and, and uh, build, build them out that, that, that way. You know? So there are ways in which people can build relationships uh, through podcasts and outside of podcasts, but we just need to get a little bit, of, a little bit creative and support that bottom line uh, uh, through through those experiences, both in the short term as well as the long term. So let's talk about some of your your success stories of maybe someone that had struggled, tried to get their podcast off the ground. They did it for a little bit, but then lost the motivation or the enthusiasm for it. Did, did, talk us, uh, how, help us see the folks that are listening how they might picture what you would help them do. Certainly. So uh, for someone who may have ventured into a podcast or, or, and, and then killed it off or uh, hasn't really thought about podcasting, uh, I'd go back to why do you want to do content in the first place? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and most don't. Be, most don't, exactly. Uh, and I would say to them, if, if you, you don't have a good enough why, then there's probably, this is probably not a good conversation to have. Mm -hmm. uh, so unless we clarify the why, Mm -hmm. uh, there is no point in going any further. And if they believe that uh, building relationships is key to, to their sales process uh, and, and building their audience, the brand, their authority, then it's probably a good conversation to have. Ultimately, podcasting is just a form of content. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if you have a good why in place, you can then talk about building out a strategy uh, and then the marketing uh, actions for it. Well, let's talk about the why. Let's... That's the big thing that, you know, people see people posting on social media, they see blogs yep. and they, they're seeing it work and their customers are expecting some version of that of them, mm -hmm. but they, the why hasn't really sunk in. Correct. Ha have a conversation about the why, where the light bulb can go off for, because the people are listening yep. it, are they're entrepreneurs, they're business owners, they're marketing directors, you know, marketing directors, those poor people, they have to convince the leaders of the company to somehow sure. move into this. Let's coach a marketing director right now. What, yeah. How can you help them accomplish this? So uh, let's take, for example, um, uh, someone who runs call, call center software. Mm -hmm. Right, and you've got a, a marketing director. Now, th this bit of software is obviously quite expensive. You're talking uh, fifty grand uh, plus, uh, probably well into hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, for just one client, uh, simply because of the number of seats and uh, and the way you need to implement it. So, for someone like that, uh, you could look at content and go, well, there's a lot of there's a bit of software out there, and and certainly websites that support it. Uh, but should we run Google ads? Should we run, you know, Facebook ads, uh, LinkedIn? What, what do we do? Uh, and at some point, you're probably going to hit a bit of a plateau. Now, when you hit a bit of a plateau, you're looking for new ideas, and that's probably a good place to be uh, in that you can then look at what, what other strategies could we use. Now, for uh, 
the marketing VP or, or marketing director of a company, um, getting into podcasting is a bit of an unknown. But the thing is, they only make sales once they have a very a well-established relationship with, um, uh, with the sales or, or call center manager uh, in a particular company. Mm-hmm. And, and what better way to do it than by inviting them onto a podcast, not to talk about call centers, mm-hmm. but about the challenges of running a call center, about yeah. people issues, management issues, et cetera. Great. But by virtue of getting to know each other, they're now aware of this bit of software who is also a potential client that can now be nurtured over time. Or they could jump into a conversation about, I have this problem with my existing software. Mm-hmm. Uh, how do you solve it? And maybe your, your software is a solution. So you could very easily go from uh, zero to a few hundred thousands of dollars in revenue very quickly, even though your, your podcast is designed for an extremely niche audience of a few hundred people. Yeah, I love that. That's a great idea to, that you would invite them on to talk about their their industry and help them discuss whatever challenges that yeah. they're having. But other people in their industry would relate. But you're being, you've got this natural endearment process going on that you're facilitating yeah. this conversation that only they could have because you're doing the hustle. Exactly. Uh, and you're just being a facilitator and, and helping them work through issues and highlight issues. And, and let's face it, uh, no matter what business you're in, it's a people business. Uh, mm-hmm. Technology is, a, is an enabler. People often forget that, but technology is an enabler. Totally. Uh, you're, at the end of the day, you're dealing with people. Yeah, so then the why becomes, well, why not? Why wouldn't yeah. you do that? Because your competitors, they're probably struggling with getting convinced over that why Mm -hmm. and then why they would take this direction to produce this content that's not super centered self-centered we're great we have great software we have great features when you could be flipping that and going hey let's talk about what's going on in your industry and figure out some ways that that we can do a little therapy session here you know most people don't buy till they've really done their research and they feel that exactly. you are a good option, yep. then they want to reach out and talk about just the specifics of their situation. Mm-hmm. Yep. So listening to a podcast several times is a great way for them to learn about you, learn about your personality, learn about what you believe in, what you don't. Certainly. Certainly. What, are, what are some of the... Talk to me about like the best podcast from one of your clients. Do you have a really fun success um, story? Um, not not per se. I mean, uh, at the end of the day, I don't really monitor their their ROI other than through anecdotes at this end. Uh, I don't ask for um, all their metrics and things of that nature. But um, look, there are there are a bunch of great podcasts out there. Um, um, each with their own unique spin. Uh, I, I myself don't really listen to anyone anymore, uh, 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 particularly including my own, uh, uh, simply because I, I hate the sound of my own voice. But um, <laughs> um, uh, I, I do I do tune in to to listen to podcasts. For example, I, I t- uh, was listening to Charlie Hone uh, and and you uh, uh, not. not couple of days ago yeah um just to get a sense of where it's at and and you have a, a great vibe and connection with your audience and and uh, certainly draw uh, elements of of people's stories so uh, i think there are pluses to each person's um podcast uh, it's just a matter of ensuring that you're resonating or delivering value to the audience in a way that uh, you wish to connect with with certain types of people I realize that some people kind of default think that they're going to be sitting by themselves and delivering some sort of lecture or thoughts, you know, just rolling with thoughts. And that can be quite intimidating for me. It's easier to do a interview 
absolutely. And help the other person shine. But I've noticed some people do just like a, a five minute tip yep. super regularly. Which ones do you like? Um, my my uh, default advice to, to most people, if they've never done this sort of thing before, uh, would be to start with an interview style podcast. It's generally easier. Uh, I think the tips and the advice uh, that's done on a solo uh, manner, I, I don't necessarily relate with a lot of those um, personally. Uh, and that could just be my the way I'm wired or my my peculiar tastes. Mm -hmm. But I think it it could work really well if you have built yourself up to a position of authority within your industry, and people are looking out for for your uh, advice and content. So, uh, for example, in in the marketing space, if Seth Godin were to uh, do you know one of those? I'd probably tune in just to just to listen to him, given that I I do monitor his blog fairly regularly. So uh, I guess th that's how I would suggest it. Uh, but if if you're comfortable enough to provide valuable tips and advice, go for it. Totally. So the in the years that you've been in business, you've been in business uh, eight years. Is that correct? Uh, thereabouts. Yeah. Yeah. So. How has your perspective of the application of marketing and content creation changed? Uh, I think um, in the early 2000s, certainly in the early uh, teens of, of the 20,000 years, uh, I'd say that uh, a content wasn't very well uh, wasn't a very well grasped idea. Uh, there was there's certainly been elements of it through the ages, but uh, I think um, Joe Polizzi and, and the Content Marketing Institute have really brought content to the fore mm -hmm. uh, in, 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 a, in a big way. And more, certainly more companies are coming on board with that whole idea of using content and content marketing. Um, the, the problem though is uh, in, in a lot of cases, I'm not sure we're necessarily uh, taking away from the noise that's out there. Uh, and so the challenge is uh, not to add to the noise, but rather to actually help people. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, uh, again, uh, teaching, uh, building relationships, I think will, will be the way to go in the future. Um, uh, again, I think it was Mark Schaefer that I was reading recently, he was saying that SEO or search engine optimization uh, probably will have limited value in the years to come. Uh, and, and that uh, we need to be looking at other ways to, to build our audience and, and uh, traffic, uh, not just through uh, search engine optimization, because at the end of the day, there's only so many places on the first page yeah. uh, of any search result. And that doesn't mean that you don't have anything valuable to say, uh, simply because you can't get it ranked. Right. Uh, and therefore, we need to be take more of a people-oriented approach as opposed to search engines and optimize this and optimize that. Exactly. That's um, the term that we use as HEO, human experience yep. optimization. And this would be a version of that. You know, you think about wanting to rank on certain platforms, to do a podcast, there's a audio layer that you're getting to expand and show up in searches. Yeah, to meet people on different areas. Then if you video it like we're doing now as well, then there's another video layer that you're producing all with one, one uh, effort. Then we take some text. Now we have like in the American West back in the day when you shot a buffalo it was offensive if you just skinned it and walked away but then the natives they would utilize that whole carcass and that's the way i like to think about it They're, we're making Certainly. we're taking a whole carcass here and we're going to divide it up and use it in all these different platforms that are applicable certainly certainly and then it's a great way to to streamline your efforts as well mm-hmm yeah, I think it's more interactive. It's more original. Yep. There's a personality. Who's the best interview? Let's leave me out of out of <laughs> your podcast. But yep. who have you really enjoyed interviewing? 
Um, Steve Sims was great. Uh, I don't know if you know Steve Sims, um, uh, author of Bluefish and uh, the oh, yeah. Bluefish uh, Concierge Company. Uh, yeah. he, he's a great character. Um, who else? Uh, the, uh, early on, uh, when I started the podcast, I interviewed, um, uh, I forget his title now, but uh, I think it was the third or fourth podcast that we released. Uh, he was the, uh, or is the chief customer experience officer. I think his title has changed, but essentially he, uh, this, he, he had this position in a company called um, Legal Vision, which is probably one of the fastest growing companies here in Australia where they're providing legal services online. And he was talking about how they have taken a very human centered design approach to the way they deliver legal services. Uh, and uh, every element of it is um, uh, noted, uh, reviewed, uh, to always be optimizing for that experience uh, through interviews, surveys, and a bunch of other metrics that they use on an ongoing basis uh, to the point where it's almost becoming a no-brainer for people to uh, keep coming back to them for their services. Uh, and that was a particularly, uh, I guess, uh, new way, at least to me, uh, of, of thinking about uh, human experiences and, and implementing them. Totally. You can imagine people that are in some legal uh, situation where their future is in is in jeopardy or in question and how yeah. nice you know the risk there is if I choose the wrong do you call them solicitors and or lawyers or what do you call them in well, lawyers and barristers yeah Your barrister yeah <laughs> so if you choose the wrong wrong one yeah then but how do you figure out which one's the right one you know and exactly. so there's a lot yeah. of risk there but that sounds like it'd be a nice way to feel understood, to feel respected yeah. and that people are really wanting to know about where you are and what you need. Exactly. Especially in a profession that's traditionally been very much face to face and uh, long and convoluted uh, to a large extent. So we met on spot a guest. That's a, uh, right. a podcast clearinghouse, I guess, of folks mm -hmm. that have podcasts that are looking for guests and podcasts that need, what's a, yeah, or, or people that are wanting to be a guest on yeah. a podcast. Um, what are some of the relationships from there? And do you, do you like to recommend spot a guest? Um, I, th I think, uh, um, places like spot a guest, podcast guest, the pod it, um, I just saw the places that you would go to uh, have really come to the fore more recently. Uh, and uh, I think you and I have been a bit lucky to, to ride that initial curve. Um, it's a great place to find people who, who want to get out there, um, uh, at least initially. <clears throat> Sorry. And um, uh, that may be a, a good place to start. But at the end of the day, from, for business at least, uh, I would very much say that Ultimately, you've got to be looking at who your ideal clients are mm -hmm. and uh, make sure that at least the bulk of your guests, if you're doing interview style podcasts, uh, are, uh, do match that ideal client profile uh, or, or segments at the, at the very least. Exactly. So uh, you could use spot of guests and all these other things as a, as a bit of a backup or to explore initially if you like. Uh, but always keep your focus on, on your client, ideal client uh, profiles. So what kind of companies do you really gel with? Do you serve the best? Yep. Um, so uh, two or three things that I'm looking for. One, uh, they need to be in the B2B space. Um, they, uh, I'd like to make sure that they are fairly mission driven and focused um, because that makes it easy for me to identify with their aims and, and goals uh, and uh, come alongside them. Uh, and three, uh, I think it works well for the companies that have complex sales involved. It's not a matter of, um, oh, it's got these features as opposed to that. And I'll, and I'll click here and purchase it now for about 10 bucks. So um, yeah, th those are the, I guess the key, key uh, criteria that I'm looking for at least initially uh, and, and, uh, if they're on board with the whole 
idea of using content and, and uh, educating people, then uh, I could certainly be of assistance to that. So you, you put people in certain platforms, which ones are your favorite for pushing out content? Um, again, I don't, uh, I'm a little careful with answering that question simply because people are looking for the best platform and, and I, uh, I'd say to people, it really depends on where your ideal clients exist. Uh, that might mean a particular Facebook group. It might be on a Twitter chat. Uh, it could be uh, on LinkedIn and, and no particular group. <laughs> so you, you've really got to position yourself where they hang out. Mm -hmm. uh, now in the B2B space, LinkedIn is of course uh, a platform of choice, um, but it would depend very much on, on your uh, ideal clients and where you find that they they hang out. It could be even on a private, um, uh, you know, one of those mighty network groups or a Discord server. You, you never know where you'll find them. So uh, there's a bit of legwork to be done there. Yeah. So what's the business environment like in Australia? Um, a bit cautious at the moment, given all that's happening in our world. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's, that's understandable. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, if, you, if you're, I think most people are keen to get back up and running and, and uh, uh, get things wrapped up, but they want to do so with an abundance of caution uh, uh, in case, uh, you know, things are reversed. So I would say for the la most part, it's uh, a lot of watch and wait and see kind of thing at the moment. Yeah, I would, I would imagine so. I'm seeing the same thing. Do before all this happened, would you say that it was an aggressive business environment, so a cautious one by nature? Um, Australia isn't um, as big a market as, as America or, or Canada for that matter. So uh, we, we do have a smaller pond to play in, so to speak. Uh, but having said that, um, uh, I think most companies uh, if, if they uh, certainly are making some sort of traction, would be willing to invest in, in growing their business and, and, and marketing strategies, uh, as opposed to others who are still trying to find that sort of initial fit uh, before, before exploring such options. So is, what area is like, do you see in the future as a potential growth area for agencies like yours? Or do you, and I'm assuming that that's where your primary market is. I'm sure you work with some American companies or Absolutely, yeah. Canadian companies, but what about Australia? Um, I, I think the main challenge for, for most of us is to keep our focus on people. Uh, uh, there, with a plethora of information and advice being given about new platforms that come out like TikTok and so on and so forth and what you can do on these platforms and things, it's very easy to think that you should start investing in those platforms and quite forget the conversations that need to be had, mm. uh, even though um, there aren't any real metrics that I would uh, particularly suggest that you look at. Um, because for, for a lot of businesses and, and marketing directors, they, they want to associate metrics with every bit of conversation uh, as to how a person is being moved from point A to point F in, in their particular sales funnel. Right. But conversations, if, if they're done well and naturally, as you would with a friend, they don't really ha need to have a metric. It's just about inquiring about their well-being or, or, or providing a bit of helpful advice uh, as and when the time is right. Uh, and there aren't any real metrics that can show that we're moving into a deeper relationship uh, uh, in, in, in this particular moment, as opposed to, uh, uh, you know, yesterday or the day before. Uh, and, and that's a bit of a fallacy, I think, we, we uh, sometimes have uh, in our minds when we come into business uh, or look at sales and marketing. And so if you're just having conversations and there is that a good cadence, I would, I would say that you're probably doing the right thing uh, and, and being in the right place with, with your potential customers. Uh, at some point in time, uh, people will reach out to you. 
uh, at, at times with a podcast, you, you don't really know who your listeners are because they're just listening uh, at times. They don't necessarily reach out to you. But then out of the blue, uh, something changes and they do reach out to you uh, via email or, or on, on a social media platform. And that's when you realize that, oh, I've got this um, director or, or this uh, CEO of a, of a big company, you know, tuning in and I had no idea. Uh, but it's in, uh, I guess, a bit of faith required in, in not trying to apply metrics to relationships, but just ensuring that there is a good cadence uh, in with, and consistency with your content, but with the relationships that you do have, that there is a good cadence with your communication and, and just being who you are. Totally. So what are some of the, your favorite business books that you would recommend? Ones that you've gotten a lot of value out that's helped you become a better business owner? Um, uh, Story Brand has certainly helped. Um, I don't have the latest book, but the, the other one. Uh, Mark, having it's... made simple. Uh, yeah, that's the latest one. I have the older one. I have it here somewhere. Building a story brand. That's right. And building a story brand uh, yeah. by Donald Miller. Um, yeah. So that's that's helped a lot. Um, uh, uh, I'm just trying to think of another one. Um, uh, I'd say, um, I- even though it's been a while, uh, the four hour week was certainly something that got me thinking. Um, in terms of the amount of time and energy I put into things, and why I would put into things, uh, why, why I would put that time and type of energy and focus into things. I mean, uh, working in large corporate organisations, uh, I would see people working weekends uh, late into the night, and in some ways that was almost a kind of expectation. Uh, but really, I, I, in thinking about it and, and in reflecting on that book, I felt that the only reason I was working was to be able to get a job, uh, pay for a few things. But ultimately, my aim was to spend time with my family. And, and uh, if that was important, then I was probably better off spending time with my family as opposed to working long hours and weekends and things of that nature. So... Uh, I guess it helped me bring what's important into into focus uh, to to a point. Excellent. So, what's one question that you wished I would have asked that I didn't ask you? <laughs> um, uh, that's a good question. Um, I don't think there's anything as such, but uh, I, I would say, uh, yeah, this this whole idea of why go into uh, a business uh, if you um, uh, uh, most most people go into business to make money and that's fair enough but what uh, another question that people should ask or I would argue that they should ask is what sort of impact do you want to make as a result of your business and and if you can answer that then there is longevity to your business and, and business purpose. Uh, and I think that's something that probably most people uh, don't, don't get asked often enough uh, and certainly don't use as a means to factor uh, their strategies and, and business growth uh, by. Yeah, I think that sometimes it takes a little bit to get your business off the ground you know, you're in that survival part of the, the Correct. Yeah. pyramid, right? You just want to eat the next day. and But at, there's a point where you start to go, okay, and we're getting some momentum here. And then you're able to take those energies and start to think about, well, let's back up and see why I really started mm-hmm. this thing. It's legit. So let's narrow in on that reasoning and make sure it connects to everything that we're doing. Certainly. Yeah. Vinay, you've been a great guest. I appreciate your time. And I'm, uh, again, tell us the areas that folks can connect with you. Sure. Um, So you can uh, certainly go to sproutwith.com. That's S-P-R-O-U-T, worth.com. And uh, just 
hit the contact form if you wish to get in touch with me. Otherwise, LinkedIn uh, is probably the best place to find me uh, and uh, connect with me. And then your podcast, the Predictable B2B Success Podcast. Certainly. You put the episode out every week? Uh, that's right. Every week. Uh, it might go to twice a week, but we're not quite there yet. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, you can certainly find that on iTunes, uh, on the website, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. All right. Vinay, thank you so much for being on the ROI Online Podcast. Thank you. It was a pleasure. All right. And that's a wrap. <laughs> Excellent.